Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. A very warm welcome to this episode of Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea. I'm excited that you are here with me today and I hope you have your cup of tea or cup of coffee ready in order to discover the first plant of our new podcast and that will be Nasturtium or as it is called in Swedish Indian Krasse or in German Kapuzinerkresse or in French Capucine or in Latin Tropeolum Maius. And what these different names actually come from, we will look at in the next episode. So be sure to be there as well. But for this episode, we have some exciting things about the history that we uncover in an interview. So you're going to learn what Elisabeth Christina Linné, Carl von Linné's daughter, discovered 250 years ago about the nasturtium how and why that discovery influenced even English romantic poetry and what such a discovery meant for a 19-year-old woman at that time and even how her discovery was explained first 150 years after she first saw and published this. But be before we head over to the interview with Annika, I want to introduce you a little bit more to Nasturtium. Uh, Nasturtium is part of a genus of 80 different plants and it has pretty much round leaves and the flowers look a little bit like a funnel. They are orange, red in that color. It's also known for its, its trailing stems and you can very easily grow it from seeds in your garden. It's an annual plant for the garden Nasturtium but in the genus there are other plants that may be resistant to the winter and they may be perennial and um, the plant was initially imported from South America in the 16th century and then it became very popular here and was quickly spreading throughout Europe and um, being started to grow in different gardens. So the nasturtium fell eventually also into the hands of the Swedish botanist Carl von Linné and he gave the plant the name Tropeaolo Maius and they also grew the plant in their garden and they had a house uh, 10 kilometers outside of Uppsala in Sweden um, and uh, Carl von Linné's daughter Elisabeth Christina she made an observation there in one afternoon of a July um, day, summer day um, in the 18th century and what she observed was that when she looked at the flowers of the plant it seemed that they were emitting small flashes of light they were some for some reason flickering and about eight days later she was able to show this to her father who also said he had never seen it um, he didn't also know what it was um, what this was coming from um, and uh, he then encouraged her to make more observations and to write uh, a paper to the Royal Swedish Academy of Science in order to share this observation. And that paper was then published in 1762 and was also commented by um, um, another professor whose name was uh, Wilke and he had a special interest in physics so he was wondering whether this observation that she made could mean that there would like be electrical discharges in the plant and it took 150 years later before a physician actually explained what this phenomenon 
was relying on and Annika will uh, say this in the interview. So I was really intrigued by the fact that such a young woman, Elizabeth Christina, in the 18th century was able to publish such an observation. And I was wondering whether that was very common, whether that was something special. And also given that she was only 19 years old um, and her background, she didn't have any studies. So I was wondering how common this was. So I decided to find somebody who had more knowledge about this time of history and also the Linné family. And I would now like to welcome Annika windal pontien Annika has defended her PhD thesis last year on the identity and materiality in the household of Carl Linnaeus at the Department of History of Science and Ideas at Uppsala University. So welcome, Annika. It was a pleasure to be invited, thank you. Can you explain a bit how this must have happened back in the days and what it meant for Elizabeth Christina's life? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, she she did publish her findings in the transactions of the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, so, and that was quite unusual that women published in, in this series of transactions. Uh, but and th there are some details. She, she is describing how she observed this phenomena. Uh, and it might have happened just like that, but probably there is also like more to this story. And it's because she describes that she saw it like once and she, she invited her father to look at this phenomena. He had never seen it either. Mm. Uh, and then she describes how she's thinking about it but she doesn't really give any explanations. She's like, she's um, uh, handing explanations over to other people. She writes that others who are, who knows more, who are more, more non knowledgeable in nature, they should answer the question why this phenomena happens. And she, she describes it, but most likely, I mean, it, it, in a text like this, um, and her being a woman writing this, uh, it's quite important to sort of claim territory and to really s describe that it is a new thing and she's the first one who has seen it and a text like this is very short and it's quite important to get those aspects um, of introducing yourself and the the um, importance of what you say uh, mm -hmm. early so this is to describe these details that is a way of of, of aiming this territory so to say and of, of establishing yourself as the first person to observe this okay. and most likely uh, she observed this for some time and also discussed it probably with uh, with her father with his colleagues and perhaps mm -hmm. also with others in the family mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see in the text, uh, it was not so easy for me to read. <laughs> if you look how things are written, every S looked like an F. <laughs> uh, but I, I read the text and it was interesting. So she said that she had observed it in July and then in August, but in August it became less. And then she was thinking maybe it's due to the movement of something in the plant. But then again, no, that there was no movement. Then she, she tried to figure out whether it was different depending on the way she looked at the plant, like where her eyes were. It was very experimental from her side without anything to really analyze it. But uh, she made these observations and she tried to figure out when she really saw it. That's true, mm -hmm. yes. And I think th this uh, method that she's using is um, quite common at the time. And it's, it's the type of method uh, that Linnaeus would have used during excursions and that he would have encouraged his other students to use as well. So I think that's just along the lines of what you might expect uh, mm -hmm. from this context, so to say. Um, but uh, there are interesting details that she gives, but probably I would say she has observed this more times than she actually describes in this text because it's a rather short text. And, and she also says that my father encouraged me to publish this in this uh, particular publication, the Transactions of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, of course, that body, that organization, so to say, was founded by 
her father, or he's one of the co-founders at least. Um, so it's no coincidence that he suggested, I think, this um, this particular publication for her. But after her own text, uh, Carl Linnaeus has also written a more sort of detailed description of the, of the various colors of the of the flowers in this plant and also they invited this other professor apparently called Wilke and he was specialized in electricity because one main line of explanation was that there was some kind of electric phenomena connected mm -hmm. to this um, to this phenomena yeah, I think in uh, it, I was very, very intrigued by her having published that at first because she, she wasn't like a trained scientist, like maybe other young people of her age were, most men. No, she, that, that's, that's correct. She, she could not be a trained natural historian, I think they would call themselves, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, she could not... Uh, be admitted to university because women were not allowed in universities at this time. Uh, now, in Uppsala, at least, um, most of the professors had also uh, education or lectures in their homes. They were called private colleges, these. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, evidence that women could take part in these private series of lectures in the professors' homes. Uh, and particularly if you were a member of the family and, and in the Linnaeus house, you know, it was very active. He had a lot of colleagues and students coming and going. He had a big collection. Uh, people sent specimens to him. It was very busy and active. And uh, even if we don't know much about it, it is likely that the members of the household, all of them had to help with these activities. So she probably had some kind of, you know, um, informal training in this mm -hmm. uh, because she was a part of the Linnaeus household. But we don't have many sources that gives us any details about this. So this is like my, you know, qualified mm -hmm. guessing. <laughs> uh, uh, but it was such a, uh, you know, it was it was such a big collection, and he had so much correspondence, Linnaeus, and so much happened. So it they couldn't, it, it wouldn't have been possible without a lot of people working with it. Mm -hmm. And the, the the persons closest, of course, there were the students that, and, and some students also stayed with the family for longer or shorter periods, but the members of the household. Uh, and also maids and footmen and, and other mm -hmm. uh, employed people, they must have helped. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. Mm -hmm. It was not common that women published um, the texts like this, like scientific texts. There are other women that are publishing uh, similar things, may, uh, in, both in Sweden but also in, in other countries, so it does exist. And if you look at the... Um, corresponding network that the Nairs had, the, all the correspondence that he wrote letters to and got letters from, there are a couple of women. Usually they're rather high ranking, so they that nobility and so. Um, so it is not very common. Uh, but the, the whole one idea uh, um, behind this, this series of transactions that was published by the Royal Academy of Sciences was that it was in Swedish. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they wanted dissemination. They, they, the idea was to, to spread uh, uh, new uh, scientific findings and results uh, to a Swedish speaking and reading audience. Whereas the universities at that time, everything they published was in Latin. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kind of that path was close to hers. So when she, when she saw this apparently interesting new phenomena, uh, her father suggested uh, a feasible way to, to publish it because this was within reach. The, we, the, the, the first woman, uh, sorry, the first woman who was um, uh, elected a member uh, of the uh, Royal Academy of Sciences, she published also in this series a bit earlier than this, but she mm -hmm. published a transaction on potato and how to use the potato for wig powder, for example, and for alcohol as well. So mm -hmm. um, th this was, she was not the first woman to publish here. Mm -hmm. 
and even if it wasn't common, it was, you know, uh, uh, it was possible for them here, mm. which it, it would not have been possible as an academic dissertation because it was only possible for men to write and mm -hmm. publish and then do those. Mm -hmm. What do we know about Elizabeth Christina's ambition to continue in science? Obviously, she only she only became 39 years old. She got married uh, eventually after this discovery. But was this well, if she could have chosen freely what to do, would she have tried to engage into a scientific career and gone after her father? Well, possibly. That's also um, rather speculative. Uh, we There are no sources that gives us any information about her ambitions in that respect, as far as I know, at least. Uh, but, I mean, why not? She she saw what happened in the household and apparently she had an interest in this. But she published this two years before she got married. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you did get married, it wasn't really possible to... Uh, continue or pursue this kind of um, work or activity. Uh, so, and she, she, they got, they had also two children. And and I mean the 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 traditional way when you got married was that you had this rather obvious or strong division of labor within the household. So the woman had her tasks and responsibilities and the man had his tasks and responsibilities. And the children and the uh, management of the household was on, on the woman's responsibility. So that is what she would have been doing after she got married. Mm -hmm. Also, the uh, they got a son and he died. Uh, uh, and that, I mean, that happened in most families that they had. Uh, children that who, who died, so it it happened in the Linares family as well. Uh, so um, I guess it, it was qu quite a lot of work uh, to run a household and manage a household, even if she had a rather small household. Mm -hmm. What uh, do we know about her mother in in this situation where Elizabeth Christina sat down and wrote her, down her her observations and maybe went away for that time, at least from her household task, because she was occupied with other things. Do we know anything how this was regarded? No, uh, I can't say. Sarah Elizabeth, the, the um, uh, mother of Elizabeth Christina, uh, she has only written a couple of letters. We, we know of three letters and they are from much later. Uh, and he, he, she's mentioned by Carl uh, sometimes also. Uh, but what she thought about the daughters being engaged in this, uh, we don't know much about that. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a fascinating phenomenon that she discovered and that later on others have confirmed. They have also seen this in other plants that had particularly these yellow orange flowers and dark green leaves. And it came eventually out that it's due to a phenomenon in the eye and not in the flower itself. Um, But then also this phenomenon was taken up into different poems. So it w I was intrigued how um, much it has influenced different areas of literature then afterwards. Is this common? Is this something that has happened uh, generally at that time? Well, um, there was uh, some interest in... Uh, botany in general, in, in plants, in flowers, particularly in England, uh, from, let's say, mid-18th century and onwards and in the late 18th century, so that, that there would be poems and, and uh, sort of uh, remediation of natural history and, and science into poetry and fiction. That is not so uncommon. It does happen. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I I would particularly suspect it in, a, in an English context, I would say. Um, but it, it is uh, intriguing. And also, I think it is quite typical that they were so interested in, in, in explaining this in terms of electricity, because the, the electricity was something rather new also. And there was a lot of speculation that electricity was some kind of, you know, innate 
life force and almost something magical. So it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that she's suggesting that and that they bring this Vilke into it that also is explaining, possibly is explaining this in terms of electricity because that was a rather sort of long-lived idea that, that that electricity was this kind of almost magical force in nature. So that that's, uh, I think, also is interesting. Mm. That is maybe why it has been spreading so far and has been so intriguing also to to in to people in different areas. This the, the magic, the magic of the physical phenomenon inside of biological material. Yes, well, that's mm. true. Mm. Also, I don't know if you if you saw that, but this Vilke he suggests that you should examine the plant for um for insects that can have that are luminous that you know uh, we don't have that kind of insects in sweden as far as i know but he suggested that you should look for for worms or, or something like that mm. on the flower before you decide it's so you can, so, so to rule that out so if there are no insects like that it must depend on something else mm. <laughs> Yes, I think we definitely should uh, look at these plants closer in July and in August and see if we can really see this phenomenon again, because even though now hundreds of years have passed, the plants are still the same and it may be still visible. <laughs> I actually have I have tried actually <laughs> to see uh, also to look at other red flowers because as far as, as I understand this optical phenomena should work for anything that is red. Mm -hmm. Because it uh, has to do with how our eyes work and function. And the red color is the first color we don't see when it gets dark. Mm. But I have not been able to experience this myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to have probably the right light settings. <laughs> Go to Lini Hammabi where she observed that for the first time in a July night and see at the right time if you can observe it. I think it's a rather short window of time when it's getting dark in the dusk where you can actually see mm -hmm. it. So you don't have much time, I think. So you really need to be there at the right occasion, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That was a very insightful um, conversation. I think I learned I learned a lot about how this actually has been at the time for her, or how it could have been. We don't know all the details, but uh, it's an it's an intriguing finding, and it was a great opportunity for this young woman to get published and to to make her observation be seen. So, Thank you so much. If you want to know more about the flickering nasturtium or Elisabeth Christina and the Linné family, I will put some resources into the show notes, which are both of biography and analytical kind, as well as uh, Annika's PhD thesis, but also a fiction book that can bring you into the mode of how life must have been back in the days. And I will also link to the Swedish uh, Linné Society and the Linnean Society in London if you want to find out more and you want to find the places where you can really visit um, the, um, the site where this actually all happened. That's close to Uppsala. So if you visit Sweden or you are living in Sweden, pay Linné Hammarby a visit. It's a very pretty place. I hope you have enjoyed this first episode of Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea. And if you want to find out more about nasturtium, I recommend you be back next week Wednesday when our second episode is released and we we'll look into the anatomy and some microscopic details. And we will also let you know where the name nasturtium and the name Tropaeolum major actually come from. If you want to make sure not to miss any episode, go to www.flora-l.com and sign up for our newsletter for reminders. Have a good week and see you next Wednesday.